Yeah. The uh, revelations of, of the mass surveillance by security services has, of course, surprised everyone. And surprise is one of the uh, key elements of a successful approach to get somewhere when it comes to spying. But because it's such a uh, predictable element, more or less, you can expect that people will be spying. We were expecting people to be spying also on our data. That's why we are well protected and prepared. It's just that we were a bit surprised about the origin and also about the scale of this. Now, Europol has a, has a very robust data protection and security framework. It is highly regulated and supervised. Actually, it seems some, sometimes as if there are more, more people regulating and supervising us than actually working at, at Europol. It is factored in from the very initiation of concepts and controls are embedded at several levels, including the monitoring of systems and data traffic. Also, the staff in general is very much security orientated in their daily work. Security at Europol is supervised by the, by the Europol Security Committee. It is composed of security experts from the law enforcement uh, community in the member states and is consulted on all relevant security-related matters. Any new system or any relevant change to a system is submitted to the Security Committee which formulates an accreditation advice to the Europol Management Board for endorsement. Also for the recruitment of staff, strict rules are enforced. Employment at Europol is restricted to EU citizens that have been adequately security cleared. Of course, key vulnerabilities remain. These apply to Europol, but of course also to other agencies and national services. These are in particular the, de the dependency on external ICT services and external data traffic. Outsourcing of ICT solutions at Europol is limited to some non-operational system that run on a separate network. All consultants that work at Europol um, in ICT have to be security cleared before they start and all their work is supervised by Europol staff. They do not have access to the business systems that are running operationally, nor do they have access to any of the data process. Europol does not use cloud services, not, nor external hosting of any of its operational IT, ICT services. As to the external data traffic, Europol has a highly secured network that extends to the national units of the member states and most of its cooperation partners outside the EU. Strict rules have been specified for such interconnections, imposing conditions for the connected state on the interconnection to the Europol network. All traffic on the network is encrypted. The firewalls at the endpoints of the Europol network in the connected states are controlled by Europol. And prior to any interconnection of a third state, an inspection is made in regard to the secu security and data protection safeguards. Europol has limited visibility on the security frameworks of other agencies and national law enforcement services. Participates in the advisory board and the management board of the EU Large Information System Agency as observer. Furthermore, it participates in the Council Working Party on Information Exchange and Data Protection, so-called DAPIX, where it promotes the, an, the emphasis on security and data protection. In general, Europol expects that its emphasis on security may not be representative for other institutions, since for us this is, as I mentioned, our core <coughs> business. And also the people that come to work at Europol come from an environment where also there's a very strong focus on security. We recruit for our operational business people from law enforcement institutes responsible for organized crime and terrorism and also back home, they're used to a very strict data protection framework. But outside Europol, we can imagine that the culture that we have, because of our core business, 
may be different, but we do not know. Key vulnerabilities that we could consider are first and foremost the, co the, co the corporate cl culture of such institutions. Then there is whether or not the staff is accredited, the use of external ICT services for system development operation, including cloud services for external storage. The exposure also of its core systems to the internet. Bring your own device is also a risk in, in corporate environments. Wi-Fi services for staff and visitors, as well as external voice and data traffic over the internet. Europol has not been involved in any investigation of intrusion or spying of other EU institutions or national law enforcement services or critical infrastructure providers. But essential in addressing the mass surveillance is to share among partners, trusted partners, what has been detected in this respect to help each other to understand, to detect and to protect against such intrusion and uninvited interception and retrieval of data. Mr. Chairman, this was my introduction. I'll be looking for the questions that will follow at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. You not only stick to the time, but you have also helped us out to save some minutes. So let's go second to our second panelist, Professor Udo Helbracht, Executive Director of ENISA for the next 10 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the invitation. And I also try to keep uh, in the 10 minutes. Um, an introduction and remark, um, one of our core business from ENISA is in to look um, upcoming technologies, look into business models, and look into IT security threats, analyze them, and give recommendations. Um, if we talk about this topic of mass surveillance, I want to make the remark that in ESA, in, in ESA mandate does not include cyber espionage. So uh, let's see how much I can then contribute in the discussions afterwards. So therefore I want to concentrate <coughs> in this uh, presentation on uh, the privacy topic. And uh, one of the two key points of IT security is uh, confidentiality and integrity, which means that either data is not stolen, lost, or that data is not compromised or changed. So I just want to give you some examples, some outcomes, and some recommendations. If you look today into the discussion, it's about personal data protection, data retention. You have different interests. You have, if you look into Europe, another basic understanding of privacy than you have, for example, in the U.S. And what I put here in red, I think it's my message I always want to try to give. Uh, we must be aware then, that in our today's business models, the new currency is personal data. Or put it in another way, in some cases, law could destroy business models on the Internet of these big companies which are working uh, and offering cloud computing uh, or other services. Another important uh, experience we made is we made a study which is mentioned there and we made it in Germany where there is a big acceptance for uh, privacy. On one hand, users say IT security is important, but on the other hand, the field exercise we made was a web platform offering tickets, 40, 50, 60 euros, and then we ask, would you disclose also your telephone number? You don't need for booking a ticket a telephone number. And we offered a discount of 50 cent. And for 50 cent, you can see it here, 87% of the users disclose their telephone number, just for 50 cent. If you look into the context, you know we have the Treaty of Lisbon, we have the discussion about the uh, data protection directive, electronic signatures, data retention, we have the technology perspective and consumer user perspective. The message just of this slide is that we are discussing a lot of things at the moment 
and we have it from different percept, uh, uh, perspectives. And um, if you have new technologies, and if you look back into history, if new technologies become business models, then these business models get their own life. If you look into data, and if you look into data privacy, this should show you the life cycle of data. Uh, data is collected, you get information of data, you use it, you put it in connection to uh, <coughs> other context data, you store it, you retrieve it, and in the end, it <coughs> might be removed depending on the model. And if you talk about privacy and data protection, then it's different actors in different points of this life cycle. And if you talk about confidentiality and integrity and availability of data, it's from a technologic and business model perspective different in these different steps of the light. This slide should illustrate if you deal with data today on the internet that it depends how you see or how you want to protect your data. Um, you have cases where your data is really posted and spread out the world. If you look, for example, what is on the left side, Google, Google Plus, not so many people currently use it, so the outreach of the data is not so much. If you really don't want to, want to expose the data, you only have the possibility not to post it. But I think we all know from the discussion that from this perspective, uh, um, it's, let me say it carefully, all US-driven business models and companies where we put our European data. This is just an overview that we have a lot of data breaches out there. It's uh, from the last couple of years. It's just figures uh, where more than 30,000 uh, records were stolen. Some of them become public. Maybe nearly two years ago, remember, it was about Sony when they lost uh, their user data and a lot of data was lost. But there is also other companies, maybe some of you even don't know, where data is stored and data was lost for different reasons. This is uh, from the Commission Office uh, in the UK. It's just about the middle of the year. It gives you data breach incidents uh, which are there. Um, interesting, there's a peak in the uh, healthcare area, uh, but this might be due, and it's also interesting to think about, that it's because there's a strong regulation about uh, breach notification in this area so um, you might not be able to compare to others uh, because um, if you have a sector where breach notification is not mandatory uh, or obligatory, then it's different when you have statistics about this. This is something uh, what we did together with the Article 29 Working Group. Um, it shall only show you that we started already in 2012 and then uh, in 2013, uh, we uh, finalized it with the technical subgroup of the Article 29 Working Group. The intention is really there to give more uh, protection and, and, and rules when you deal, how you deal with data. And I think, uh, at least from my side, I think we have a good cooperation uh, and then we try to support as much with our technical competence, the Article 29 Working Group. Uh, this paper will be published in a couple of days. I want to make uh, two statements on uh, cryptography and on uh, uh, the right to be forgotten because this was also discussed. Um, the message here is if you talk about protection of data, then we have a lot of technologies out there in the field which could be used to protect data, but they are not implemented, not used, or they are not a business case for, for companies. Um, what I mean by this is uh, uh, we have encryption, we have different types of encryption. You can get very good encryption, which is hard to decrypt or to, to hack. And you should think in your private and business life about the fact that the question is how long should be a data secure for yourself or for your business. If you run a project for half a year and after that you might not need to uh, really have the uh, contract with, with another company in the same way secured if you have, let's say, a governmental meeting 
with another government where you want to talk behind closed doors, if it's in the newspaper after a couple of days, you don't need to secure this data longer than a couple of days in some cases. So what I want to say in some cases, it's enough if it's hard enough for the other side to hack the data, but in some cases you want to keep your data secure for a lifetime, for decades of years, then you need much stronger encryption. But you have a lot of technologies available you could use. The same is for qualified electronic signatures. We have this technology out for more than 10 years, but we still send around emails which look like postcards written with a pencil. Everyone can read it and everyone can change it if you want it. So if you would use these technologies, it would be easily to secure emails. So it's very difficult to get these technologies in the field, <clears throat> but the message here is um, we have it, and we did for the first time from ENISA this year a publication on recommendation on this uh, aspect because you have a lot of publication in national languages of the member states, but we try also to put this information at least in English for all 28 member states to a public audience. Uh, so the basic message is, as I said, uh, you have the technology out there. So just give me the conclusion. Uh, we need more collaboration with the data protection authorities and the Article 929 Working Group. Um, we are able to provide opinion. Uh, we support the NIS directive to extend uh, breach notification to other sectors. We promote cryptographic measures. And um, the links between the NIST directive uh, policy initiatives and research development should be used much more. And this is just an uh, advertisement we have with the next Greek presidency uh, privacy forum in, in Athens next year, and everyone who wants to talk about privacy is invited to come there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Udo Helmert, Executive Director of ENISA. Now it's foreseen. We're going to move on to the third panelist here this afternoon, who is Mr. Florian Walter, Independent Information and Technology Security Consultant, for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah, hello. Thank you for having me here. My name is Florian Walter. I'm from Germany. I worked the last 12 years as a security consultant and as a penetration tester. So my job was to break systems. I've broken numerous systems from electronic passports to automotive construction lanes to blood testing devices in hospitals to cars to, you know, whatever has an IP and an operating system. Um, so I brought no presentation for you, but I, but I brought some good advices from my 12 years of experience. The first thing you have to understand is that there is no 100% security and there never will be. Security is always a right on the edge and you need to balance things. Security is not about being secure or not being secure. Security is about balancing things out. A balance between usability and security, for example, a balance between costs and security. Um, so you can't get 100% security. You can always just put the bar as high as it is needed to frustrate attackers so they don't hack you and they don't enter your networks because it's too much hassle and too cost-worthy for what they get out. That saying for, that's said first. Um, another problem I see is, for example, that the European Parliament also um, made laws that enable companies, organization, and government agencies to hide information about security problems and vulnerabilities within systems they know about. As long as those organizations, companies, agencies are allowed to hide 
their information that they already have on security problems within common computer systems, um, you have no chance to catch up because they know already about the holes and you don't and how you want to defend against holes you don't even know about and you don't know they're existing. That's like kind of a problem. Laws like this was also made here. I was here in the Libé committee to talk against this. Unfortunately, nobody listened. Now we have to deal with the consequences. Um, another thing you need to look at is like um, budget, for example. I mean, the NSA has a budget of 56.8 billion US dollars a year. How much is your budget about IT security? And how much is your budget about toilet paper? It's probably higher. Think about this. And you can't, you know, you can't estimate that you're not being attacked or not being hacked as long as you spend more money on toilet paper as on IT security and as long as adversaries like the NSA have even far more budget than all European institutions combined have on IT security. But it's not only a question on budget. It is also a question on knowledge of your staff and your personal. You know, how good are the people that work in your IT department? How well do they understand the systems that they are taking care of? Do you have any idea about this? Probably you don't. And probably the people working there, there also have just limited knowledge about the systems they are using. I mean, they buy ready off-the-shelf software from mostly American companies where the standards the systems are built after maybe have been made or influenced by the NSA. How you want to get your system secure if you start off with those kinds of operating systems, office software and so on. Have you ever thought about this? You should. You know, as an attacker, you have a strategic advantage compared to defenders of, in, of computer systems. Because as an attacker, you only need to find one hole. As a defender, you need to find every single hole. So this brings me to not only you need to have good personal, good educated staff, and enough resources and good systems <coughs> to protect your infrastructure. You also need to have um, the possibility and the ability to realize when you get hacked. You know, in the hacker scene there is the saying which goes like, there is only two types of organizations on the internet. Those who know that they are hacked and those who don't and the EU institutions are probably part of the latter one. This is something you should also think about. You need something like rapid incident response. You need to be able to deal with hacks when they occur and not like six months later. Because always remember, the best hackers are those who you never find out that there was there. And all those hackers out there, and especially the state-sponsored ones, are good hackers. Trust me. They know what they do. And they know your systems inside out, better than your own staff. So, um, you know, as an, when, when an attacker attacks one of your systems, um, the attacker has the advantage because he only needs to find this one hole to exploit to get into your system. But as soon as the attacker is, has been hacked or has <laughs> hacked into your system, this strategic advantage shifts toward the defender side because it's your system. You control the power, you control the hardware, 
you know, then you have a real chance to catch them and to get them. But you need to realize first that something goes wrong and something happened. And this is why you need very good and timely incident response and you need the capabilities to even realize that when you get hacked. So most of you now probably think about antivirus software, intrusion detection systems, or even intrusion prevention systems. You know, you can buy those also off the shelf, also often made in America, and they have huge price tags. And I tell you what, it's mostly snake oil. Don't spend your money on things like that. Because antivirus systems, intrusion detection systems, and all that sort of security software does nothing more than thousandfold your attack vector. Those systems parse data, and parsing data is one of the hardest things for programmers to do correctly. So with such systems in place, you just thousandfold your attack vector, but you don't, you don't get safer, and your IT secure, your systems don't get safer. What you really should have is enough staff that takes care about your systems and staff that is well educated and knows about their systems. They have to know them inside out so that they have a chance to realize if something goes wrong, if somebody broke into and changed vital functions of the system to the advantage of the attacker. So that also means that, that you cannot have like one administrator taking care of thousands of systems. If it's a really important system, you should have one administrator for this one system. So to summarize this up, um, complexity is one of the worst enemies of security. Always remember that when you ask for a new feature from your de IT department. You need to have better and more resources. You need to have more, probably more staff, and the staff needs to be better educated and to know their systems pretty well. Um, yeah, basically, that's what I can give you as an advice to get better IT security in EU institutions. Thank you. We thank you, Mr. Walter, Independent Information and Technology Security Consultant. Just for your information, let me just remind you, because you mentioned that we most appreciate most warmly, most warmly, every explanation which is delivered by the guest speakers that uh, we have here in the Libe Committee. We have most appreciated yours, but just let me, uh, let's, let, me let me assure you that when you as so many other guest speakers do speak, some of us do listen. Some of us do listen. We do listen. That's what we're here for, among other things, not only for that, also to elaborate and to make up our mind, an opinion of our own, but of course, we, we most appreciate every, every testimony we hear in the gatherings of the, of the Libby Committee. Now we've heard our three panelists here, Mr. Bugadich, from Europol, Professor Helmbrecht, Director of ENISA, and Walter as Independent Security Consultant. It's now the time for questions and answers, so I suggest we follow the same routine we practiced so far. First, in, uh, for the sake of efficiency, two rounds of questions. First floor goes to the rapporteur, our colleague here, Mr. Claude Moraes, and then shadow rapporteurs. Then we will be having a first round of answers from all of our panelists here, and then some additional room for maneuver for the rest of the members and attendants of this meeting which are willing to contribute or make specific questions. First floor to our coordinator, Mr. Claude Moraes. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, um, no, that was a very interesting um, uh, contribution and yeah, I've just bought a stack of new antivirus software which I'd heard you before I did it but never mind. Um, let me begin with um, our colleague from Europol. Um, it's been a, a continual um, theme of our hearings for all of our members. Um, so please don't be surprised when, when you get these questions, I think, from all of us, um, as to exactly what the role of Europol is here and the cybercrime um, centre. 
uh, because towards, I was listening to your statement and towards the end of the statement you said um, that you hadn't investigated uh, the allegations or the intrusions, uh, but that the cybercrime uh, centre was going to protect against future um, intrusions. Now, the problem is um, Europol is democratically accountable uh, to the Parliament and uh, we have a whole set of allegations. And when I say, talk about Belgacom, it's not a set of allegations. I mean, these are proven intrusions. We've had uh, the staff of, senior staff of Belgacom coming to tell us they're not allegations, they're proven. Uh, and of course, we've had the whole range of um, allegations on Google and Yahoo and so on. Um, so my question is, why have these investigations not happened if you're going to be protecting against future intrusions? And I won't go on further, but just to, to put that question to you, which is something I think all of my colleagues uh, would ask. Um, and can I ask um, um, really this question to Anissa and also to um, Mr. Walter as well? Um, just the question on the, the current parliament IT systems and our own security. I know that you, from the ANISA um, contribution, I know you were talking about our own security and encryption and so on, but can you be a bit more specific about the recent issue about parliamentary security and what you would recommend to, to improve our uh, current systems? Um, and to Mr. Walter and, and his contribution, you were talking about, I think you're talking about um, commercial software that, you know, that we access commercial software um, without knowing source codes, but is, is open source um, solutions better? I mean, what, what do you do if you don't access commercial solutions? That would be my question to you. Where do you go if you don't go for these commercial solutions which you say are from the United States and so on? Thank you. We've had first round of questions, first round of answers. First floor, maybe the same order, the same order, Mr. Bugatik, then Professor Helmbrecht, and finally Mr. Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moraes, for this, uh, this question. Um, the European Cybercrime Centre has been established within the framework of Europol. And Europol has a specific legal framework, a specific mandate, and a specific objective, and that is Basically, we are there to support the member states in their investigations against serious organized crime and terrorism. And when we look at that perspective, first and foremost, it's about investigations with the intention to bring things to court and to have people convicted. Now, when we look at state-sponsored activities, of course, the chance of ever getting anyone convicted is not really the focus. We are, not fo we, we are focusing on, on organized crime, criminals that we can put in jail. And that is a key, key focus of us. And there is, believe me, there is a lot of work in that area. Actually, we were set up within the framework of Europol, also without any budget. So looking at the work that has come towards us since the beginning of the center, uh, we are completely flooded. It has been a major success. And especially when you look at the much more international focus of member states together with external partners on getting on the really big cases, cyber cases against organized crime towards us, the comparison to the previous focus we had on more national investigations with some international links, those had uh, more or less uh, arrests in a number of, of dozens. And the case we're getting now are cases with arrests in the number of hundreds, some even beyond that, into the thousands. So the cases we're getting are, are much bigger. We have a limited number of staff. And so for additional things that are actually not really in the, in the framework of what we were established for, it's not something that, that um, the member states really ask us to prioritize. Thank you. Hey, Professor Helmbrecht. Okay. It's a pity that I got the first question and the second question goes to him. Uh, Inisa is not in... You can shift, you can shift if you prefer to. <laughs> I, I have answered like two to? if you... Uh, okay. uh, let me say the following. Inisa is not involved in IT systems of EU institutions. 
So we don't know uh, about the status of this. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm the wrong person for this. But just give you an example uh, about open source uh, versus uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, not open source. Um, I think the problem is if you talk about IT security, that IT security is a business case for those who provide virus detection, firewalls, and this kind of stuff. And you must write it in red. IT security is not a business case for all the others. That is the problem. This means if you are a company and you sell a product, then the question is, why do you spend on IT security? How much do you spend on a mobile phone if you sell it? How much do you put IT security into a car if you sell a car? And we don't have found from the experience with Enisa any model which is an initiative that IT security becomes a business model for those where it's horizontal. And just a final statement, this is my experience. I was um, six, seven years the chief information officer of an insurance company in Germany. And I was seven years the president of the federal office in a uh, security office in Germany. In the former one, I only run, I'm honest, for software like Microsoft, IBM, Oracle. That's the easiest way for a chief information officer. You're responsible for running the system, and security, you hope, doesn't have a problem. With the BSI, we had half of the agency with, it's not advertisement, Microsoft, and we had operating system, um, and we had uh, open source for the other half. It's a nightmare for the IT for interoperability. So the message is we can mitigate, but the problem is how do we deal with getting IT security into the business model because it's a cost factor. Thank you. Mr. Walter, your turn. I agree with Mr. Hambrecht that um, like security is more like a process and not something you can spend money on and then it's gone or something like that. And I also agree that for antivirus and firewall producers and companies like that, IT security is like a business case. For everyone else, it just costs money and it is more burden. So, but you as a EU parliament, you can shift that equitation. I mean, why it is that it is a burden and does cost more money for everyone else? I mean, what does companies do that sell software? They want to make money. They want to get rich. They want to pay out money to their shareholders. So, therefore, they don't care about security because security does cost money and effort. So if they want to pay out to their shareholders, they just ignore security and give you what I call banana software. You know, it's green when it ships to you and it's not fully ready and it's not secure. Um, and why, you know, and there's a simple economic reason for that because they want to make money and security does cost money that does not bring money to you. But you as an EU parliament, you could, can change that equitation. If you help, you know, software companies are not liable for their products. If somebody sells you a car and the brakes are not working, the car manufacturer is liable. They need to call back the car, repair the brakes on their own costs, ship it back to you. That costs money. And therefore, car companies do whatever they can to ship cars where the brakes are functioning because they are liable. If you buy software, there's always this disclaimer in the first screen that you have to click away and that probably no one reads. This software is provided as is without any, without any liability. If you change the liability for software, the economical equitation for software companies looks completely different. From there on, they are liable. So if they ship software that is not secure by default, that has not privacy by default built in, they have to pay extra. The, the customers you know, ship back the software, they have to repair it, ship it back to the customer. That costs money and they can't pay something out to their shareholders. As long as you don't do that, 
you will always have banana software. It's on you. Okay, now let's have a second round of questions from the shadow rapporteurs. We'll get started with Sophie Infeld, would you? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thanks to the three gentlemen for their uh, introductions. Uh, I confess I had to chuckle a little bit at the introduction of Europol when you said, and I think you're right, that you have a culture of security and, and protection of data and so on uh, because it's your business. And then I, I was thinking to myself, that's what the NSA thought. Um, but they didn't calculate in the human factor, so now all their secrets are out on the street. <laughs> anyway. Um, no, well, I, yes, it's, it's a bit, uh, I'm, I'm a bit depressed after the words of my neighbor here. Um, because it, it seems that there is, there is never uh, enough security. Um, but of course, the, the budget element and the, 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 the expertise required, that is something to be considered, and it's been raised before in this committee. Um, but I think one of the difficulties is, is that of public opinion, uh, in particular when you look at the EU institutions. I mean, you know, I'm very happy to go out there and argue for a bigger EU budget. Um, it is, you know, almost certain uh, to, to not get you re-elected. It's simply not. Uh, so we need, we need to make the case for uh, a higher budget. And now, of course, we're also stuck with the silly system of a seven-year budget. Um, but I, I think that's definitely something to be uh, considered. Your idea about liability, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because if you, you make the comparison with a car and its brakes, but that is something that you can, where you can set a, a standard. And, you know, either the brakes work or they don't. Whereas you yourself have, have, have you've explained how um, security threats evolve all the time. So if you buy a product which meets a particular security standard at a particular point in time, it may not necessarily do so one year from now. So can you then actually hold the, the company liable? But I'm, I'd be interesting to, to, interested to hear if there, uh, if there are indeed uh, certain standards. And then um, um, another question I read in the newspaper yesterday about the Belgacom case, which we've been following uh, here that uh, they've been very busy trying to remove the malware from their systems, and apparently they've not succeeded so far. Now, you know, I'm an IT zero. I, I work with my, my phone and my, my tablet, but I have no clue about these things. I mean, that m must be some pretty strong stuff. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear your expert views on that, uh, and if you have any idea, you know, what, what kind of malware that could be and, and what could be behind it. And then um, finally, there is a question, not to anybody in particular, but I'm a bit, I'm a bit uh, puzzled that we are discussing the security of IT system of the EU institutions here when this house um, was hacked, what, two weeks ago, I believe, with, with something that was very, very simple. Um, as far as I've been as far as I've seen, the only response to that was that the IT department said that we should all change our passwords, and they've closed down the Wi-Fi. So are we now safe? No. <laughs> Somehow I had the feeling you would say no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Chair, you know, if we're going to discuss security of our own IT systems, maybe it would be good to have the responsible people here. We actually had them here one week before we learned about the hack, and they said, oh, everything's fine. Well, apparently it wasn't. Maybe we can invite them back. Okay, let's hear now from a guest who heard the questions, now the answers. Please, Mr. Bukadix, would you like to? Yeah, to my, uh, to my knowledge, Mr. Snowden was a contractor. So it was, he was hired from outside to the, to the organization, and it is, that is where we make a clear distinction between our internal staff and contractors. As I mentioned in my introduction, contractors do not get access to our operational systems, do not get access to the data that is processed. So there's a very clear <coughs> limitation as to what they can do in our system. But I fully agree that even though you, and, and, and um, also my um, uh, co co fellow um, speaker here introduced that there's no such thing as absolute security. It's just that you have to be aware on all the aspects 
of security to make sure that on all of them at least you increase as much as you can, also within some reason, the level of security. And you have to be aware all the time. And then still it can go wrong. I'm not excluding that anything can go wrong in any organization. It's just that as long as you are aware of the, the security aspect, and that's what I try to, to uh, emphasize, in our organization there is this culture. There is this culture also between colleagues that you correct each other when someone uh, kind of doesn't take security rules seriously enough. So that culture I think is very important to make sure you, you, you maintain the highest standards throughout your organization. And if I may also when it comes to the car and the brakes, I like that, that comparison. Why? Because uh, my car after four years needs to be tested every year. If my, car, if my brakes are not working, I'm not allowed to use it. My computer is infected, and even if my uh, service provider knows about it, he doesn't have to take any action, and I can continue to use my, my computer. Even if I'm informed, I can continue to use it. And there's no liability, there's no responsibility for me towards the other users. It can be part of a botnet, but, and, and having an effect on, on, the, on the, the, the security and, and safety of others. But there's no one telling that ISP, listen, you can't allow infected computers to run on your network. You have to inform them, they have to get disinfected, and then they can get back on the internet again. And that is w one of the elements that we really should be working towards. It's responsibility and liability, not just of the manufacturers, but of all users. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's all. Um, a general statement. Uh, if I just turn on my wireless LAN, it says here Android AP4176. So I turn it off. Somebody must use his mobile phone also for something here. So the problem we have is it's about education on both sides. And what was said by Mr. Walter about budget in the IT staff, this was covered. But the problem is that we have a technology where we, were not, we, we did not grow up with this. We are not socialized for this. And the problem is, if you look back, the Internet was designed very simple, with very simple standards, with very simple protocols. And what we did over the last 20, 30 years is building, building security on top. And the problem is that not everyone uses the top security possibilities, encryption if you uh, uh, enter something. And the problem is if you look for this, what happened with the email passwords from, from the Parliament, it's very, very easy still today to put somewhere a wireless LAN hotspot as a private person and then get the data traced and then you can read passwords, you can read emails, and then the data is lost. So it's, it's good to ask to change your password, but the problem is the usage of the technology. And I think this is something that you don't drive with 200 kilometers on a wet street. You know this, but you do the same here. And I think it's then a question that we need both. I could not agree more with Mr. Walter. We need better implementation of technology, governance structure, education. And on the other hand, the question is how can we educate the users that they're aware of the risks and are aware when they use this or that. Thanks. Um, yeah, to first sentence to the first question which I, which I haven't answered. With open source software, you can at least look at what the software is doing because you have the source code. And in case of emergency, your programmers can fix it because they have the source code. With commercial software, you basically use a black box which you have no idea about what it's doing. Um, to the other questions, um, I start with the hacked wireless LAN here in the EU Parliament um, two weeks ago. Um, you basically named it before, human factor, but also technical um, factors. Like, you know, if, as I understood this hack, um, there is a guest wireless LAN, and some members of the house use the guest wireless LAN to log into their email accounts. And on, on while the credentials was transferred on the air, somebody took them and could enter the mailboxes and the systems with that credentials. So one problem here was that people used the public wireless LAN where everyone can connect to and can sniff the data that is transferred on the network. 
um, to enter their email thing, that's the human factor. And the other part is that your IT department somehow did not take care that your email clients, your mobile phones, your tablets, whatever, are setting up an encrypted tunnel first. If you have like a VPN, which is started up automatically at startup, um, this could not be happened because you can still sniff the traffic, but you don't see the passphrase and the username anymore because it's into, in the encrypted tunnel. And if the encryption is done well, and you followed maybe like the ENISA guidelines for using encryption, that is unbreakable at least for like, you know, a 14-year-old guy or like whoever it was. Um, on the Belgacom malware, I mean, that's the problem what I, what I mentioned before, um, that the attackers most of the time know the, bet the network they are infiltrating much better than the defenders. You know, Belgacom probably has one administrator for a few hundred or even a few thousand of systems. The attackers have a team of highly skilled attackers to attack just one system and to keep it available and open as an entry point to that organization. So that is, yeah, often um, there's humors in the scene that even attackers fix the, soft, the, the systems they infiltrate in order to hold the administrators away from looking too closely at their systems because something is not working. So as an attacker, the best thing you can do is keep the system running because then the administrators think everything is fine and they don't look at it closely. So, you know, I don't wonder that you don't get that malware away because, you know, the attackers have more budget, they are better and highly skilled, there's more people on one specific task, and on the other hand, you have one administrator that has the task to take care of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of systems. So how closely he can look at a system? How closely does he know the system? How deep is his technical understanding of what is going on into the system under the hood? Probably it's commercial software, a black box. They have no source code. They, it, even in the documentation of the, of the manufacturer is not everything mentioned the system is capable of doing. <coughs> um, so you don't know if there's maybe backdoors implemented in those routers from companies made by companies outside of Europe and maybe infiltrated or like, you know, influenced by some adver adversaries. So um, even though you remove the software, maybe they can just go in the next day like this because they have a secret password that always authenticates one. This would not be the first time that things like that happen. And that is maybe already built in from the factory. If you had open source software, you could actually look for that backdoor. Or for, mostly it's not a backdoor, mostly it's bugs. And, you know, so this way you have possible deniability and you can go there and say, oh, this was a bug, we are sorry, we fix it. But in fact, it was a backdoor put there by intention. But you can't prove it. So most of the times you don't find real backdoors, you just find bugs. Okay. Is that it? Thank you for that. Let's move to the rest of the shadows involved. Mr. Albrecht, the floor is yours for your round of questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think I have to be the one who is a bit uh, yeah, more offensive on uh, our guests, um, especially starting with Europol. Um, because you were lining out that uh, we have to understand, you have to focus on organized crime and what you have gi been given in your mandate. If I have a look in the Europol uh, yearly report, I see things like animal rights, terrorism you focus on. It's, it's in your report. I mean, there are so many issues in your report. And now we talk about cyber attacks, if not going until the notion of cyber war taking place in the European Union, by, by attacks 
which we don't know completely who have launched it, so we cannot exclude that it's perhaps a, a, a criminal or an authority acting uh, above the law or whoever. We cannot know because if there's no investigation, we don't know exactly. But it's an attack, and it's not a small attack. The attack on the Belgacom company is huge. The attack proven in the documents by Edward Snowden on servers in the European Union of Google, of Yahoo, the today re revealed fact that location data of mobile communication hugely, daily, has been accessed also in the European Union. I mean, this is more than organized crime because it's not based on EU law, it's an infringement of EU criminal law and EU law which we have voted last year on cybercrime. And um, I even go further. Here it's about snooping on economic valuable information, for example. What's behind is a huge value. It's billions, it's billions of euros which we talk about. I mean, this is more than organized crime. This is, this is economic crime we have to fight, and this is crime, uh, crime against uh, information security and, um, of course, against the rights of citizens, but that is not so important in your meaning, obviously. Um, so when, when we talk about this, I, I really think that you have to get your priorities right. And I, uh, I mean, I was in the impression that we spent money on the EC3. Yes, of course, we spent additional money in the, on the EC3 in our budget. Yes, of course. For Europol, we spent more money for the EC3. And I was in favor of it. And I am still in favor of it. But please, then you have to do your job right. I mean, here it's really about the, the crimes... Uh, which we focus on cyber attacks, investigating cyber attacks. And that I really would like to know, has there been any, any authority in any member state requesting your help to investigate <laughs> possible infringements to cybersecurity in Europe, possible infringements to our criminal code of conduct or laws, uh, or not? If not, then this is really, again, I mean, outrageous with regard to the Belgiacom incidents, to the uh, obvious access to, to a service of telecommunications uh, companies in other member states, and of course about uh, the access to millions even, uh, or, or even more, hundreds of millions uh, of citizens' personal data being protected by data protection law. I mean, uh, just about this, and of course there's not only data protection, the fundamental right, but also the fundamental right of the integrity and secrecy of my communication, which, by the way, is not only a fundamental right for you citizens, but a human right. And we also need to care of, the, uh, of their rights. So I really, I'm, I'm really a bit wondering if you get the point right in your center, uh, and uh, I really would like you to actively bring forward the, these investigations and even ask the authorities in the member states if they should not start investigations on it. For example, when it's about SWIFT, when it's about this, the, the broad access to SWIFT data in, in contradiction to EU law, of course you have the possibility to, uh, to, to, to start investigations on it. I mean, and, and if, if there's no request, you should really talk with these authorities. This is about fighting crime. This is about fighting crime, really. I, I really wonder where we are here. Okay, that was on, on, on Europol. I'm, I'm sorry to take so long time, but uh, on, on, on Inisa, I, I think that um, also here we need, to get, we need to get the point right uh, for, for which purpose we set up Inisa. The European Network for Information Security, uh, uh, the, the European Agency for Network Information Security. And, and I think that um, this covers, of course, the, uh, the protection of all information uh, uh, systems in Europe, and it also should cover uh, those of the European Union, uh, at least if you talk about the CRT, the, uh, uh, the third uh, teams, where it's about the reaction to 
uh, to those insecurities, um, also the European Union's uh, networks should be in your focus. But even if you, if you don't want to talk about that, then let's talk about the Microsoft systems on all of our institutions' networks having obviously huge loopholes so that some hackers can just access my email account through the Microsoft systems yeah, and, and get, the, uh, get the contents of, of all these emails. I think here we really have to, to do something about it, and I, I, I would like to, to focus uh, on that, and I would like to, to ask also uh, how you see uh, how the, uh, these loopholes can be closed in, with these companies and, uh, and what is necessary from the policy side to be changed if you think that, uh, if you would agree that we are not there uh, to achieve real network security. And then uh, my last question uh, to Mr. Walter um, on the loopholes existing. Uh, I would really like to, to know if you know and uh, uh, on, on which loopholes you would know uh, when it comes to those cases like Belgacom or other information systems of telecommunications uh, servers or networks here in Europe. Uh, do you know about specific loopholes? Are you uh, assuming that there are loopholes and do you think that we already uh, somehow have somebody taking care about it, if there's improvement also since uh, there is uh, the work of ENISA coming up, uh, I would like to somehow get a bit more insight uh, on the actual state of uh, development. Thank you. Okay, this is the European Parliament, this is the Libre Committee, so it's only clear that, uh, that uh, we're more than free to state our mind and our views on every subject, but considering that we have uh, three sessions afternoon and we have a timing to go through, please try to refrain to specific questions so that it'll help us with the timing, because there's still some way to go, two other sessions in a row this afternoon. Now, time for Athens. Mr. Bogadic, you go first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht, for uh, this um uh, uh, the, these points. Uh, when we, um, <clears throat> you are absolutely right. When we get a case in, um, we have an open mind. We look at it, and we have number of ca numbers cases eh, that come in huge, massive attacks against financial institutions, etc. And we support the member states in making sure that uh, we get the best out of their resources. And we, we, we contribute with, with expertise, with tools, etc. But in the end, it's a member state's investigation. We have no co coercive powers. We have no court at the EU level where we can go and prosecute at EU level cases that, that we would be the initiator of. No, it's a, it's a national court. It's a national prosecution service. It's a national law enforcement agency that takes that forward. We have the possibility to request member states to look at things. That is correct. Now, when we find out in our assistance to the member states that certain things are state-sponsored, then, of course, if it's, if it's organized crime, etc., then we, we pursue this, etc. But when it becomes state-sponsored, uh, there are other elements that we have to consider. First of all, is this really what the Cybercrime Task Force was established for. You mentioned cyber war. Now, cyber war goes to the military. We don't work with the military. This is another domain. Uh, State-sponsored attacks, especially against the, the, uh, the governments, there we are, we are talking more towards at national level, the way it's organized at national level, for the intelligence services rather than for the police services. The way they want to work with us is that these are police cases, Prosecutor is there that in most of the member states has the, the final responsibility over the investigation. And then the aim is to bring it to trial, to bring it to court to make sure that uh, suspects are convicted. In these cases, uh, when, it, when it's really state sponsored, and especially in, in cases where they are found because Mr. Snowden has indicated uh, that this was, was the case, by default, we can assume that it's state sponsored because we know where, what, what the origin is. So our focus and what we do is basically uh, follow the guidance provided by the member states. They tell us 
what to do more or less and what not to do. They have the investigative powers and also they take the decisions on what they investigate and what they do not. And last but not least, they certainly decide when or not to involve Europol, EC3 in this case. So that is why, on the basis of what we've seen, we are there and we are asked by the member states to help them in lots of cases. And as, I mean, if you just look at, at, at the, the, the damage for the financial sector with all the, the, the attacks, if you, if you look at the, the, uh, the, the damage that, that there is for in, in general by, by, by cybercrime to, to the broad uh, economic area, uh, we are really supportive to the member states. They're very happy with us. It's just that when it comes to uh, the state sponsoredness, they are not keen on having our help. Thank you. Okay, then I have to ask two specific questions to that. First, does that mean that you know, so you proved that these attacks were state-sponsored? Full stop? Is that the, the, the reason why Europol doesn't go on with these investigations? Because you know that they are state-sponsored? And the second question was uh, already in my first question. Did you get requests by member states to investigate those attacks on information systems like Belgacom, like Swift, like uh, the Google and Yahoo cases? Um, to the first one, we have not yet come across cases where we started with an open perspective and identified that it was state-sponsored and therefore referred them back. Uh, that I'm, I'm confident that because that would have would have come up. On the second one, I'm not entirely sure. I, I simply don't know whether we have been contacted formally or informally about Belgacom or Swift. It doesn't ring any bell to me. But I'm in charge of, opera of, of strategy, which is one of the departments. The other one is is operate. So, not everything is brought to my attention. Uh, but if it were, let me put it this way. It would have been likely that I would have known if it had happened. Let's put it that way. It's just I can't give you the full guarantee. Thank you. Okay, now, Mr. Helmbrecht, Professor Helmbrecht. I completely understand what you say, but the challenge for us as the European agency is the following. We got a new mandate this year, and in this process, Commission, Council, Parliament, Nobody wanted to give us operational tasks, full stop. Uh, we have the evaluation in our regulation for 2018, so it's up to you to the Parliament. Honestly, we are giving recommendations, we're looking into technology, and we cannot do more than recommendations. Uh, that is an inherent issue. If you talk about the topic of the agenda, about mass surveillance, the member states look carefully that we in our work program have nothing which steps on their national sovereignty. Full stop. Walter. So, um, about loopholes. I mean, um, as I said, you don't find backdoors, and nobody writes like backdoor on it. Um, what you find is bugs, and some of the bugs look like they've maybe put there intentionally and their inherent features are in a way that, you know, that's the only useful case of those bugs. Um, what I can give you as an example is two cases which we know from the Ecolon investigations 10 years back, um, where the one case is um, in Microsoft NT5, somebody in a pre-release version took the cryptographic API apart. He disassembled the closed source code, basically. And Microsoft didn't, didn't fault or had an error in there. They shipped the um, release candidate version with debug symbols. So it was relatively easy able to see what function is doing what and where and, you know, there was even names on the functions, so you could see what it probably does without deeply investigating it. And what he find, found in the crypto API of that Windows at that time was um, a second crypto key implanted in the system, which was called NSA.key. 
So what was, the, what was this for? Microsoft later said it, this was for backup purposes, but you know, this is complete bullshit. You don't need to have a backup key there as a second key. It's enough if you make a copy of your one key and hold it on different locations. So ask yourself why there is a key, a key in the crypto API of the Windows operating system which is named NSA.key. I can only come up with one conclusion. But this is left to the listeners. Um, the another, another example I can give you is Lotus Notes, or yeah, this email program from IBM. Um, they had like a feature with, which was even described in the official user documentation um, with a special crafted header on the email, which, um, which had the parts of the cryptographic key used to encrypt the message within that header encrypted with another key. So if you are the entity that have that other key, you could like listen on encrypted emails and due to the information in the header, you was able to decrypt most of the encryption key used to encrypt that message and therefore decrypt the message. So I can also only come up with one conclusion for what this was useful, you know? If you give that key to law enforcement or to intelligence agencies, your intelligence agency can read all the encrypted email of the system while others can not do so. So this is clear indications for, you know, implemented backdoors. Um, I think the adversaries learn from this lesson and don't do such obvious things nowadays anymore. But, for example, if you look at routers, like those machines that, run, that forward our data packets in GSM networks, in the Internet, everywhere, you have always those little boxes called routers. I mean, look at router security. Just Google for it. There are so many, so evil bugs in routers. You know, it's easy to take over a complete network of routers when you have a little budget and some skilled people and you put them at the problem for some time. Even, like, you know, hackers without any big funding can look at it for a few weeks and they find ways to exploit and take over routers completely. Um, if you then consider that there is one administrator at a telecom company that you know take, is taking care of thousands of routers in a network, how high is the likelihood that he will ever find out that something went wrong? Thank you. We're way behind schedule, but we still have some shadow to hear from. The questions, please. We all should bear in mind the timing. There are two sessions to go. Frau Ernst. Jim. So is this. Indeed. Well, if I've understood correctly, if I've understood correctly that the European Parliament probably spends more money on toilet paper than on IT security, then presumably you know, um, there's not a lot we can do about it. Uh, you can't really draw any other conclusions from that. We have adopted a multi-annual financial framework in which the majority of the European Parliament was quite happy to vote along with uh, cuts, including in the IT area. Most colleagues, not I, but in the end that doesn't actually help. But over the coming seven years, up to 2020, we can reckon that we won't have very good IT security because we simply don't have the money for it and it's not on the line and because we're not interested in it and because everything we're promising are fine words. Fine words, but without any bite. So I'm just wondering, you said we need a decent IT system. We need staff who can cover that, who can uh, keep up with the changes and update the system. Of course, it's not just a question of having one head of unit in charge of the whole thing. So you need a different form of organizations as well. Um, I got from my LSU an, a message saying that there was a, a, an incident, I'm informed, 
and then I'm told, well, you have to change your password. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if that's the way to deal with these sort of things. So the most basic question I can put, what should I do as a member? How can I protect myself? Or what, what would your proposal be, given that things are as they are? And given that we don't have a great deal of hope to suddenly come up with uh, millions of euros to throw at this problem, we're not going to change the problem. We're not going to be able to deal with this in a, in a proper way. Secondly, Europol, did I understand you correctly when you said that you do not know if there have been incidents or not? I mean, how, how do you know that? How do you know that really? No, turn for answers. Mr. Bugadich. Um, if I understand you well, <clears throat> Madam, um, you referred to my answer previously that we're not aware of. Uh, okay. Well, the problem is that unless you know exactly what you're looking for, it is difficult to identify if you have been hacked. It's just that throughout your entire work, you can make sure that there are the impediments for actually hacking. There are the controls that if you are hacked that you can uh, identify and monitor uh, strange behavior that is, that is uh, not in line with what you would <coughs> normally expect. You can ensure that uh, your technical staff regularly assesses the security measures of, of, your, of your tools. And there's a number of things that you can, can number of measures that you can take. It's just that there's never a 100% guarantee that you are absolutely safe at all times. Um, so, uh, basically, there is no 100% guarantee. It's just that what can be done against it to prevent it and to uh, to identify it, to detect it, if it has happened, that we have done. But I think that applies to, to, to everyone. I mean, I don't look every day under my car to see whether there's a bug placed under it somewhere. I, I don't do it because I don't actually, I really don't expect that. But uh, if you do that, if you are aware of that, and you would expect your car regularly, um, and you put it every day in a, in a locked gar garage, then you already are minimizing the chances that something like that would happen. Thank you. Meyer answer in German. Ich glaube, da müssen wir. Well, I think we have to keep things in perspective here. The European institutions are doing a lot for IT security, and I'm sure they spend more on IT security than they do on toilet paper. Uh, well, we do, at least. And it is the case that if you ask us, what can you do? Well, there are a number of recommendations, including from ANISA, that you can apply. Uh, behavior when it, when it comes to social networks, or, um, getting stuff from app stores, these sort of things. These are, this is advice that you can have. Um, you can use, say, PGP. Um, you can have electronic signatures on your emails. If you have important things, you should encrypt them. My motto is always that we should use the technology we have in a better fashion and inform you how you can use it because the things that we have are being used to far too little an extent. extent. Mr. Walter. Um, since I have no insights in the technology of the e European institutions, I don't know for sure how much money is spent on toilet paper and on IT security. In most huge organizations, it's more for toilet paper. Um, anyway, um, what you can do I mean, maybe the resources that are available for IT and IT security can be used more efficient and more focused on to target like the issues obvious. Um, also, like maybe you can change regulations that you have. I mean, in most huge organizations, the user, as you are in here, 
um, cannot like install PGP and sign and encrypt their emails because you don't even have an administrative account where you can change things on your computer. So maybe you need to push forward um, decisions that enable you to get PGP installed and get like a training how to use it or to like install it yourself and get the permission to do so. Um, and another factor which, or another thing which you can do is like um, train the users, um, shut down the human factor um, by learn about how to behave and act securely on wireless LANs, on social networks whatsoever. Part of the two weeks ago hack, as I said, was um, the human factor, that somebody used the unsecure network to send credentials in clear text unencrypted. If you know about this as a user, that, this, that you are going to do this right now and that this is dangerous and that everyone can read your password when you're doing this, you probably don't do it. The problem often is that people just have no idea how things work and what they're about to do. And so I can just say, train your users better. Make them aware of the risks they are facing. Okay, now we've had a round of answers and according to plan, there should be <coughs> some additional ground for other members willing to make any other question, but if it's not the case, we should be moving on to the following point. And we would appreciate that because we are way behind our schedule. So we should be moving to the second session, which is the one concerning the presentation by our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, of the working document on U.S. and EU member state surveillance practices and their impact on EU citizens' rights. Report on the Libya delegation to Washington. We should be catching up. So we thank Mr. Moraes for his efforts to help us out to catch up with the timing. Mr. Moraes, the floor is yours. And, and of course, we warmly wave goodbye to our three guest speakers for the first panel. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you for having delivered your testimony here. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Moraes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Juan. And uh, colleagues, we're, we're running uh, massively over time. And I know uh, colleagues, uh, certainly uh, members have got it, and guests will have trains to catch, um, planes to catch. Well, I've got a train to catch. Um, so I'm going to go quite fast. Um, but please. Um, that's not um, in any way intended to, to skim past anything. It's just in terms of how much time we have, because we have no less than five working documents to get through now. Chairman, if I, um, in this section, go through uh, the surveillance um, working document, which is mine, and then the Washington one together, and then, and then open for questions, would that be course, acceptable? You're free to arrange your... Okay, let's, um, let's go... Let's go for the working document on US and EU member state surveillance practices and their impact on EU citizens' um, rights. First of all, in this working document, uh, which is mine exclusively and not with any other uh, shadow uh, colleague, um, the purpose of this working document was to present a comprehensive overview of some of the most expansive surveillance programs both in the EU and US that were both reported in the press since last June and were the subject of the Snowden allegations. I've also included reactions uh, from US authorities and EU member states in relation to the various uh, programs as part of the fact-finding missions of this inquiry um, to gathering all relevant information and evidence from both US and EU sources. Both the US and certain EU member states are engaging in continually developing advanced capabilities of data interception, analysis and storage. This has all been made possible by an increased focus on security developments in communication technologies, advancements in large-scale interceptions, and this is the key point, weak oversight mechanisms. And again, the key point is that, um, most importantly, um, many of these advances have been done uh, without any prior public debate. 
So weak oversight mechanisms and no prior public debate. Those are the key points. The working document also focuses on the international and European legal framework in relation to, in relation to mass surveillance activities, including how the operation of these surveillance programs have impacted on EU citizens' rights. Um, I primarily focused on the impact on citizens' privacy and data protection rights, but also on freedom of expression, of opinion, of association, right to effective remedy, and right to a free trial. From the Libe Committee inquiry meetings, we have heard that in international law, due to the scale and arbitrary nature of the reports of mass surveillance, these programmes appear to be in contradiction to Article 17 of the UN International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In terms of the ECHR, member states are obliged to ensure that any activities carried out by their national security services, including in cooperation with other state services, are in line with fundamental rights. Now, in relation, first of all, to journalism, and secondly, in relation to whistleblowers, um, I've talked about um, the inquiry um, issues in relation to journalism, for example, uh, the investigation um, inquiry evidence given by Alan Rusbridger, where he talks about um, reactions from state authorities having a chilling effect on journalism, for example, uh, the Snowden revelations um, uh, producing negative impacts from the state and how journalists have um, been affected by those negative impacts. And then in terms of whistleblowers, we have gathered evidence which highlights the crucial role they play in unveiling serious violations of fundamental rights, but, but as a consequence, how they're extremely vulnerable to retaliation uh, from the state. As a result of this, finally, um, the ECHR has upheld whistleblowers' rights of freedom of expression, along with several other initiatives from the Council of Europe. Now, the European Parliament, civil society, including in Transparency International and others, have advocated for stronger whistleblower protection. So I, I have recommended, as is the European Commission, in adopting sectoral provisions on whistleblowing, a more comprehensive approach at EU level. So that's a, that's a summary of um, what I've said in my working document, which is a draft working document, um, which is subject to um, any amendments and, imp and improvements. If just for time purposes, with our imaginary chair um, in situ, I'll just go straight on to the Washington, um, uh, to the Washington report, and then I think we open up for questions. I'll both chair and... Um, say this, I'll, pr I'll uh, do a dual role here, which is probably slightly undemocratic, but um, let me just go into the Washington um, report, which I'll make very short because colleagues who were there know exactly what happened. Uh, but for the record, I want to first of all express my thanks on record to um, the Secretariat, um, Mr. Antoine de Caen, and each and every one of the uh, Secretariat of Libe and also um, uh, the AFET colleagues um, for what I feel was um, a, um, a delegation visit that was very detailed in the shadow of what people remember was the shutdown in Washington, which made it extremely difficult to put together a program uh, which turned out to be as comprehensive as it was. So I'd like to put on record my thanks and the thanks of members um, for a really comprehensive delegation visit. Um, to talk about the substance um, for a moment. Um, my feeling was that within three days, um, we both covered the uh, congressional part of the uh, visit very adequately um, with um, Congressman Sensenbrenner, um, but also um, Representative Rogers in covering um, both the Committee on Intelligence uh, but also the Committee on Judiciary. Um, we um, had ad hoc meetings um, via our connection with the AFIC Committee and met with Senator Dan Feinstein and the Chief of the NSA, Keith Alexander. We um, had access to the Department of Homeland Security, um, but also meetings with the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Um, meetings with the Board of the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technology, 
an extremely good meeting with um, Robert Litt, the General Counsel, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and uh, at the White House with Lisa Monaco, Homeland Security Advisor to the President. Um, and I'm going to miss out one or two meetings, but we ended the, we came to the end of the meetings uh, with, um, for example, a meeting with the U.S. Department of Commerce and U.S. Federal Trade Commission on the subject of safe harbour, uh, which illustrated uh, the comprehensive nature of uh, the delegation visit. I'm going to um, just make a couple of um, comments. Um, I think it is true that we could have done many of the things that we did in Washington here, but I think I, I'm, I'm sure that members will agree um, that it was worthwhile to extend part of inquiry to Washington um, for the added value that it gave us um, in actually meeting uh, people that we would not have met here in uh, Brussels or Strasbourg. But additionally, we made contacts, particularly in Congress, who then visited us here uh, in Brussels. And I think those congressional contacts were particularly important because if I just make one comment, they have created a connection with Congress on the question of the NSA um, issue, um, which I think will be lasting contacts beyond this inquiry report for the Parliament, which I think were extremely useful. So just to take one example of why this delegation uh, visit was um, of added value, I think that was just one example. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, that would be my report. And again, thank you to the individual members who I think gave um, extremely, um, gave of their time in an extremely detailed way throughout those three days. Um, and I'll end there to our imaginary chair who is not sitting here. So can I, will I chair um, this? Okay, so can I, uh, can I now duly chair? And I think, I think on the, for the working documents, I think I should open it now to the members um, to, Will I just move on straight to the next working document? Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Okay, fine. Uh, right, let's move on to the next working document, which is the, um, the presentation of the working document on foreign policy uh, aspects of the inquiry um, on mass surveillance. Now, this is... The chair is back. Um, um, now, this document is co-authored by myself and three... AFET members, and Mrs. Ana Gomez is here um, to speak to the document. I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks and then hand over to Anna for the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, just to begin um, by saying that to thank the AFET Committee in particular, uh, who were, as I said, were involved in the Washington delegation and who are providing an opinion to this uh, report. Um, the document, I believe, uh, uh, creates a comprehensive um, balance on, if I could say, in the discussions in the AFET committee, um, the key point arising was this issue of loss of trust in relations between the EU and the US. This, I think, was the key point where damage in trust between the EU and US had occurred uh, following the disclosures and mass surveillance. And um, this, is the, this was the key issue that AFET members coalesced around in this document. In addition to the allegations of mass surveillance, the working document also refers to the um, spying allegations in relation to Chancellor Merkel, um, the issues of counterterrorism and national security, um, uh, but concentrates, I think, very much on the importance of our transatlantic partnership in the fight against terrorism. It, it talks about the delegation meeting to Washington, um, and I think some of the other key points, um, I think, um, were in relation, I think, to the area covered very much by um, uh, Mr. Albrecht in, in terms of the data protection package. I think this is a very important element of our delegation visit, which I didn't mention on the Washington element, which I want to mention now, which is one of the lasting elements of both the Washington delegation and now mentioned in the AFET report, which I think is, the, again, the added value of this inquiry, the added value of the delegation visit, 
is that we are unique in the European Parliament in having an inquiry which has at its core a data protection package. And that data protection package is the lasting value of the inquiry. That we're setting up the inquiry because we want to create trust, because we don't create trust in areas such as Safe Harbour and other areas. We will not have a lasting relationship with the US uh, on data protection, which is critical uh, to commercial transactions and to the human rights aspect of um, our relationship on intelligence and other matters and anti-terrorism agreements and so on. So I'll finish there and hand over to Sorry, Chair, if I can course, hand over to Anna, Anna Gomez, who is one of the rapporteurs on the AFIT document. Thank you, Claude, and uh, thank you for the, the, the introduction and the comment you've already made to our joint work. Indeed, we believe it was very valuable that we went together uh, and with the different angles from AFIT, but as well with from LIBE colleagues, we could... Uh, uh, have meaningful dialogues with our American colleagues. And I must say, being a member of the U.S. delegation going regularly to Washington, I, I realize that uh, they never paid so much attention to us due to the fact that they have, as I, we have, the sense that this was a major crisis of trust in, in our relationship. Uh, and and, and uh, because, of course, apart from the already uh, difficult issue of data protection for our citizens. There was the issue of the spying, uh, the no distinction between allies and adversaries, and the, the clear breach of trust that this implied. I believe as well that our interaction with all, our different interlocutors, bo both at the State Department and the NSA, the government, the administration, and at the Congress, was really very important. And uh, I, I really believe that it helped shape their reply, because I sense that their reply was indeed very fragmented, very disorganized. We got a line at the State Department and at the NSC, which was not the line that we got at Congress, although at Congress things changed after the meeting with uh, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Keith Alex Alexander. Uh, because Diane Feinstein brought the Congress closer to a line of the administration, which was to acknowledge that indeed a major problem had occurred, the major serious uh, breach in the trust uh, uh, was, was there to deal with, at a particularly unfortunate moment because, of course, there is much interest on the U.S. side as well in the negotiations on the TTIP. And the negotiations on the TTIP, don't forget, in the current area, are about digital trade. So it, these things cannot simply be put off the, the, the hook. That's one reason why, for instance, we advocate in this report that indeed we really concentrate on the EU-US umbrella agreement on data protection, separate from the TTIP and prior to the TTIP, because otherwise it will contaminate the TTIP negotiations. Uh, inevitably, because the TTIP negotiations have to be about the digital economy. That's about data. Uh, the other major difference between the Congress the, and the administration was that um, uh, in, in the Congress, the line, namely by uh, Representative Rogers, that, by the way, I hear is coming soon to Brussels, which is also a good sign of that interaction that we now can develop with our American colleagues. Uh, he was saying, okay, guys, yeah, well, we do it. Everybody does it. It's, we're not the only ones. I mean, Spain does it, France does it, everybody does it, and by the way, we're saving lives. So, okay, let's go on happily doing that. That was the line. We save lives. So, heck with the data protection. That was not the line of Senator Feinstein, who had the Senate Intelligence Committee. I think it was also very relevant that not only she had this meeting with our uh, team, including with, um, with uh, Keith Alexander there, but she then went publicly and criticized the agencies for, for indeed uh, uh, what has happened uh, and said that it is necessary to investigate, echoing the line of the administration. And, uh, and I believe that is probably what also prompted uh, a reversal reaction 
That same afternoon, we, there was a press uh, a hearing in the, uh, an audition, in, a hearing in Congress, where Kit Alexander and the others decided that it was time when, when Senator Feinstein sort of was been, had always been a very consistent supporter of the intelligence committee activities, came, in, came out acknowledging that there was, there was something very wrong, that the, the FISA courts and whatever, the system for accountability and, and monitoring had not worked. This really uh, gave the red lines to them and put them in alert and probably put them in the, a more defensive, offensive mood. In the administration consistently, we have, in the, namely the State Department, but as well in the NSC, so the, the national security in the White House, uh, the advisors to President Obama, this line, okay, we acknowledge something went uh, wrong, uh, is wrong, that needs to be worked, at the NSC, at the White House, they went even farther than that. They actually said, let's try to learn with you from your own experience. Let's try to see how out of, uh, uh, we can take lessons out of this crisis to really improve. That was positive. I don't think what was, what was not positive and was that at the State Department, when we raised the question of judicial Please. regress. Mrs. Gomez. I mean, some, some members are starting to be concerned about the timing. Okay. Well, uh, and, and, and if you please okay. summarize, summarize the, so I would these say aspects finally, of the trip, but go to the report. Question go is to the report. Which judicial, is the redress, thing about it. judicial redress, which is, of course, a very important question for us, for our citizens, because the American legislation does not provide for judicial regress, although they are obliged by the international uh, covenant and civil and political rights and so on. Uh, at the State Department, we got a line, no way, because if we open this door to you, then Afghans come, come, come asking for the same. It was not the line we got at the White House. So I think we need absolutely to insist on that. This is a very minimum. And in this respect, I must say that I'm really uh, um, wondering what, what does Commissioner Redding mean when she, a couple of days ago, said that data protection rights are... Uh, don't need to be included big in negotiations because they are not negotiable. But yeah, but they have to be uh, guaranteed for our citizens, and that includes in the U.S. And I guess it would benefit as well U.S. citizens if they would come to uh, indeed a minimum standard of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of that, uh, judicial regress for any citizen, not discriminatory, as it is not our case, and it is their case. Um, I think um, the other thing I would like to stress is I think this really showed that we need democratic oversight. And so there is a long way to go for us in exercising that democratic oversight, especially when we know that we have divided competences on the European level to deal with the framework for data protection, but then at the national level with national security being still at the national remit. Thank you, Mrs. Gomez. Back to you, Claude. Again, I think in view of time, I think we're, we're finished on this point, uh, Chairman, um, and we can go on to um, the presentation of the working document on democratic oversight. Of course. Um, I'm happy for Mrs. Intervelt to, to introduce if she wants to do that. Sophie, do you want to do that? I'm sorry, uh, my apologies, we've lost. Mrs. Ernst, I mean, this is the squeeze on time. My apologies to her and to her staff as well that we've lost her. But if we can carry on, I'm just looking to everyone if we can carry on with this. Well, so actually, we... actually, the scheduled time for this debate was six, uh, excuse me, 1640. 1640. It's five, so it's not the end of the world. So, sure, sure we are way behind. Sure, sure we're in delay, but it's, it's not like. You know, I'm, and I couldn't make it because everything got out of hand. No. So, I mean, it's the usual no, I, thing I, I know, that we, we are I, 20 minutes I, behind, I, I know, not the end of the world. So. I, I know in, in, in Parliament time, that's, yeah. that's nothing. I know, but on Thursday afternoon time, it's probably okay, something. Okay. But, um, could, Chairman, just from a democratic point of view, I, it, you know, because Mrs. Ernst is not here, I just want to see, get sort of just okay. general consensus that we can go ahead. And I'm looking at her staff also, that we yes. can at least go ahead now. Is that okay? Sophie, this is a co-authored report by Mr. Moraes and Mrs. Invelt. If you want to explain, do you want to go for the introduction, point? Mrs. Invelt? 
Well, it's, it's a report by Mr. Moraes, Mrs. Intveld, and Mrs. Ernst. Um, uh, and I, I don't think I should do a, a full introduction, but I'd like to make some remarks. Um, I think uh, everybody would agree that oversight over the activities of secret services or intelligence services um, is, is one of the, the key issues that has emerged from these hearings um, and also from everything that we have learned uh, from all the revelations in the media. It is clear that um, oversight, to, to start with, oversight at national level is simply failing. Uh, it's too weak it's, and it's, it's no longer uh, well suited for the kind of activities that secret services are, um, are developing. Um, and we see that there is increasing cooperation, new technologies that give them opportunities to cooperate more. And I think it is uh, it's a basic principle in any liberal democracy that um, uh, where there is power, there sh should also be checks on power, and clearly we've not adjusted to, uh, to modern times. So I think one of the key recommendations should be that the, uh, the national systems for democratic oversight um, over secret services have to be strengthened. And then... Um, if national member states in the European Union decide to do so, it would make sense if they would all do so on the basis of um, uh, identical standards. Because if secret services work together cross-border, um, then we have to be sure that we can rely on oversight systems in other member states to make sure that our, our um, fundamental uh, rights and freedoms are protected equally across the European Union and that they don't just sort of leak away by, uh, through cross-border cooperation of secret services. And a second dimension obviously is, um, uh, is oversight over, um, over those cross-border activities, the international activities, as well as the emerging, let's say, EU secret service, although it's not officially called that way, it officially doesn't even exist, it doesn't even have a basis in the treaties. I think it's included in the organogram of the external action service uh, with the dotted line only, although I've heard that there, you know, there are an estimated 70 to 100 EU officials working there. So it's a kind of ghost secret service. <laughs> that officially doesn't exist, but it's operational, it's there. Uh, and I think we urgently need to organize oversight over INSEN, but we also need to, to think of oversight mechanisms uh, for cross-border activities of um, secret services. Um, so I think all those, um, those elements are present in the, um, in the working document, and I hope that what is now called questions or uh, what's it called? Yes, questions for debate and solutions that they will be converted into recommendations. And there's one that I would like to highlight, um, and that is uh, the one, two, three, fourth paragraph under the heading solutions. And it says a high-level group should be set up. Now, I usually, you know, my skin crawls when I hear um, uh, things like high-level group or working groups or uh, task forces is usually a way to, uh, um, you know, to, to refer uh, a topic um, or to, to hit it into the long grass. But in this case, I think that we should think about this very carefully because we're heading towards the end of this term uh, of Parliament. We'll be adopting these recommendations just before the end of term. And we need to find a mechanism, a, a way of ensuring that the, the next parliament after the elections immediately continues the work uh, and that the recommendations that we will, um, that we will draft will actually be um, um, put into practice in the next mandate. I think that's important. Now, if anybody can think of a better term than high-level group, um, you know, that would be most welcome. But we'll, we'll need to somehow... Uh, you know, ensure that what we conclude doesn't get uh, shelved like the, the Echelon recommendations, but that the work continues in the next parliament. And that should be more than just a general recommendation saying, oh, you know, we need to, to, to carry on the good work. We, we need to make sure that there is um, 
continuity. Then maybe one... Uh, yes, one last remark I would like to make is about um, transparency. Because we talk a lot about transparency, and you know, I've never heard anyone argue against transparency. Uh, at the same time, there is a transparency regulation which is currently in force, uh, which is extremely weak. Um, Council and Commission, in particular, have a tendency of, of not applying it in full. And you know, I know I have first-hand experience because I've made countless requests for documents. Uh, and, and some of the, uh, the, the requests, or rather the refusals by Commission and Council, ended up before the court uh, in, in Luxembourg. Um, however, the proposals to, uh, to upgrade the transparency regulation are stuck. And I think this, this House should be adamant that uh, any revision of the transparency regulation should lead to a stronger transparency regulation and not a weaker one. And therefore, I'm very concerned by rumors I hear that certain groups in the European Parliament would like to propose that we basically um, uh, accept what Council and Commission are proposing and that we would uh, go along with a weaker transparency regulation. I will f very firmly oppose that. And then finally, I think that, that something that I have proposed in um, my report on the annual report on transparency, which I presented earlier this week, is that we need, we have a rule on transparency, but we don't actually have procedures for the classification of documents. And therefore, if any of the institutions refuse access to documents, it's extremely difficult to challenge. The only, um, the only avenue available to citizens is to go to court. Now, I can tell you, I've been litigating for what, five, six years now? Um, you know, costs may be prohibitive for the, for the average citizen. So we need procedures for the classification of documents, and that would equally apply to documents relating to uh, intelligence work uh, uh, in the European Union. They should not be automatically exempt. Uh, and we should have an oversight body, something like uh, a transparency agency or transparency officers inside the, uh, the EU body. So maybe we can include those recommendations uh, as well. Thank you. Sinveld, back to you, Claude. If I could just um, thank you for that introduction. I don't want to add to it because of time, but just one, just on one point, um, that clearly with oversight, we found that clearly this is a national uh, competence and it's national intelligence agencies, and we don't have a, a legal competence at EU level. So many of the questions for debate in the working document are centred around this, exactly how will we have any EU remit here and um, I think that's where we will concentrate looking at how we recommend things for example on ITSEN and also in how we um, try and get some transparency for EU citizens particularly where there was cooperation between intelligence services. So I just wanted to emphasise that because it's clear that we should also recommend what national inquiries have been doing which is to strengthen and recommend the strengthening of national intelligence services transparency arrangements where they're weak um, it, that's our duty because um, where we don't have competence there we should be honest and bold enough to be recommending national strengthening and not um, not abrogate that responsibility because we also represent European citizens. So I think, I think, Sophie, you were implying that as well, and I think I just wanted to add that to the rest of what you said, which I obviously agree with in the working document. I, I, was, I was going to make the same remark. I think, you know, nothing should stop us from making recommendations. Um, you know, this is not about subsidiarity or EU powers or anything. This is about fundamental rights. We should make the recommendations. If then national governments choose to ignore the recommendations, then they should explain to their citizens, you know, why they don't want adequate oversight. It shouldn't be for us. We should do our, our duty to the citizen. Okay, thank you. Now it's time to move to the following point. I mean, you want to... Do you want to dwell on this issue? Because I was going to give you the floor the following <laughs> report. I, I know, but uh, before I get the floor on the other working document, I would like to come into this point, and I completely agree with that. I would like to bring in the idea, I mean, we are now discussing an oversight model for Europol, 
and perhaps it would make sense to open that up also for INSEN and uh, the intelligence community and remind <coughs> that I was a bit uh, surprised when I heard that here in this parliament there are four or five members doing oversight on INSEN. You don't know? There is. There is. It's an, it's an interinstitutional agreement with the council or with the member states only. Um, which I see is, uh, first of all, ridiculous that we don't know. I mean, we, we are in charge of doing fundamental rights assessment and, uh, and also, I think, uh, security in the European Union. It's ridiculous that we don't know. And the second point is that obviously those members don't feel obliged to get in contact with us on that. I think here is a severe communication problem in this house. And then I heard that in the interinstitutional inter agreement, it's uh, mentioned that only the two bigger groups have seats in them. I don't know. I don't know. But um, and that one of those have given one seat to the liberals. I don't know who's in there. I, I just realized nobody knows here. You know. So I, I just tell you that I'm very uh, this. Uh, uh, comfortable with that and, and uh, uncomfortable with that, and I think that uh, we really should talk with them about that. Thank Please, you. Mrs. Gomez, clarify this point. I just found out recently that indeed such, an event, such as a system or whatever a practice, I don't know, exists uh, and is supposed to at least involve the coordinators in NAFET bureau, in large bureau. I'm one of the coordinators. I've requested that, but this requires national clearance and it didn't arrive yet. So I'm, I, haven't, I, I, I have not been at all involved in that process. So I don't know, really. <laughs> Whatever has been happening has not been happening with me since I've been coordinator. Information. I think you should do a point but I'm sure if you ask uh, Mr. Brock, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, he will give you more details. Sure. Chairman, I think you should do a point of information because there is some uh, current knowledge on this point. Um, I mean, I, I can I? Uh, by the way, SITSAN is not an intelligence uh, agency. It's a situation center for getting information and uh, analyzing information. And it's information on foreign policy uh, that is advisory to the, foreign, to the external action service. It was something that existed, was created in the days of Solana, so it's supposed now to be assisting uh, Lady Ashton. It's not a proper uh, intelligence agency. It's not really... Uh, gathering information, it's, it's analyzing information. Like all intelligence services are doing. We oh, only yeah. analyze, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, it's called INSEN now. INSEN. And actually, it doesn't have a real legal base. And actually, it's uncontrolled by any parliament. So we don't know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. OK, I'm, I just must tell you that um, I'm just learning about the situation now. Right on the spot. I'm sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. I wasn't. This is an effort issue, but I'm, I'm trying to gather the information point from our services, the secretariat. So, if you allow me, I will read the point that has been made just on the spot by the secretariat, just to let you know that the current interinstitutional agreement on transmission of confidential information. Uh, they, uh, only, only, only deals for foreign affairs AFIT, but there is a new version, also with uh, justice and home affairs issues. So LIBE will be associated in the future to this point, to this, to this agreement on transmission of confidential information. I wasn't aware about that. This is a, it seems to be an AFIT issue, an AFIT decision. So just for your information, as the concerns were raised, raised and uh, some doubts were put in place. Now I think, having heard of this, we could move on 
to the presentation of the working document on relation between the surveillance practices in the European Union and the United States and the European Union data protection provisions, which is co-authored by our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, and the shadow rapporteur, Mr. Albrecht. Who does want to make the presentation? Please, Mr. Albrecht. How many minutes do you want? I mean, I, I, it's up to you, but I suggest as we are way behind, I suggest you <laughs> just go tell right to the point because there should be some, maybe some floor for questions and answers. Okay. I don't know if there are members enough to make points, but if you please, do no, it. No, it's, it's okay. I just wanted to know, so I do it in two minutes. Um, so this uh, working document basically lines out uh, the mass surveillance practices, first of all, of, uh, of course, to recall what are we talking about. And on the other side, the EU, uh, so mass surveillance practices in the EU and in the US, and on the other side it lines out the EU and uh, the European data protection law, so the EU law, the primary law, and um, the data protection law. And there uh, we, of course, come to the point that, first of all, um, Generally, member states are obliged to, uh, to follow EU law, primary law, secondary law, and uh, also in this uh, field there are uh, provisions on data protection, and if you could switch off your microphone, then we wouldn't hear your mobile. Okay, thanks. Um, so there's data protection law and, and no problem, <laughs> there's data protection law and cyber security law and uh, cyber crime law, and those have to be uh, followed. But of course, there is this notion of national security, uh, which has seemed to be an exclusion to EU law and EU secondary law. And uh, there it's obvious, uh, still, obviously still a debate uh, how far this exclusion or this uh, reference of national security uh, goes and in how far it uh, could carry um, the possibility for uh, those surveillance measures to not be subject to those provisions. Um, generally, uh, there are provisions uh, applying in EU law to, to everything, also to the field of national security, but of course national security is outside of the scope, for example, of data protection law. Uh, therefore, we have to clarify the scope of national security and also, we need to uh, clarify clearly, which is the case, that the national security of third states is not uh, an exemption to our European Union's law and to EU secondary law. So it can only be an exemption from, for the member states and their activity. Uh, we need to clarify that member states need to respect uh, EU law and EU secondary law, of course, um, we need to clarify uh, the exemption or the notion of national security. Um, we need to also clarify that um, uh, for the data protection rules, there should be a clear application uh, protecting the fundamental right to data protection in EU law uh, comprehensively, that there's no so convention by those measures uh, to these legal provisions, uh, which is not uh, fully uh, justified under justification either in secondary law or in the exemption for national security. And um, we also need to negotiate um, the, the framework agreement between the United, European Union and the United States uh, on data protection in the area of police and judicial cooperation, which of course is not uh, carried by national security but generally val valid when it's up to law enforcement. And uh, we also point out the uh, Cybercrime Convention and the 108 Convention of the Council of Europe, which both uh, should play a role in enhancing the application of data protection principles um, in this area of member states and third states activities. And last but not least, uh, the Europol regulation should include an article stating that data obtained in violations of fundamental rights in accordance with Article 6 and the culture of fundamental rights shall not be processed. And uh, that is more or less uh, what is in this working document. There are a number of uh, conclusions uh, in addition, but uh, I would leave it at that point as we have no only short time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any comment?
Mr. Well, Chairman, that was a very comprehensive rundown, so I don't have anything to add. It's not the case. We could be moving. Moving to the following point. We thank our following guest. We're catching up. We're catching up. We have a final session three. Impact of mass surveillance on confidentiality on lawyers' client relations. Most juridical specialized issue. This very item is going to be dealt with. Hello, be welcome. Thank you. We're honored to have you here. It's going to be dealt with by Mr. Jonathan Goldsmith, Secretary General of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, CCBE. We're going to be hearing their presentation as the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe has issued a statement in October expressing anxiety as to the risks that mass surveillance arouses, notably in eroding secrecy in the legal profession and the trust of citizens in the rule of law. This most relevant matter, most relevant guest speaker, Mr. Goldsmith, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You have to speak even slower than that because we're just waiting for the slides to be, uh, to be loaded up, uh, which, they are, which they now are. So, they are on the way. They are on the way. Uh, thank you very much to the committee for uh, inviting the CCBE to speak. Um, the CCBE is the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. Our members are the member bars. The slides are now up, and we can... Uh, Go, ah, but they're not showing on the screen, fine. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful, beautiful map, which you can't see, which shows the extent of our, uh, our, our membership. Essentially, we have uh, 32 full members and 12 observer members and represent altogether uh, over 1 million uh, European lawyers. Uh, as you said, we have issued statements about the uh, impact on lawyer-client uh, confidentiality uh, of the, uh, the revelations made by, by Mr. Snowden. The essential question uh, can be put very simply, uh, and the essential question uh, that uh, we would like to address is addressed by this question. If I am Edward Snowden's lawyer, what guarantees are there about the lawyer-client confidentiality between me and Mr. Snowden? I think we all know the answer to that. There are no lawyer-client uh, uh, confidentiality guarantees uh, between us. And so if we are to see what the impact of that is, we need to spend a minute or two uh, looking at what professional secrecy, as we call it, is uh, and why it exists. So essentially we're talking about confidentiality between lawyer-client. Uh, it exists in all member states. Uh, it is called different things in, in different member states. Uh, essentially, it is the nature of confidentiality. I shall refer to it uh, by the term of professional secrecy, um, uh, which is effectively what is protected by the laws, the constitutions, the criminal codes uh, of the various member states. Uh, it is not only recognized in every single member state, it's also been recognized uh, repeatedly in judgments of the European Court of Justice uh, and of the European Court of Human Rights. There are a number of things to say about it. Number one uh, is that although we call it lawyer-client confidentiality, the Americans call it attorney-client privilege. It's not for the benefit of lawyers, it's for the benefit of citizens. It is a citizen's right. And its purpose is to protect clients and ensure the proper administration of justice. So, protecting clients, uh, what, is, what does that mean? Clients must be able to speak to their lawyer in full confidence and tell the full truth to their lawyer. They might be, uh, for instance, being intimidated. Uh, they might have 
embarrassing things they don't want to come out. They might have other illegalities they're trying to hide. Nevertheless, it is in the interests of the overall administration of justice uh, that lawyer, that clients have full confidence, tell their lawyers the full truth, that is in their interests and in our collective interests. Uh, so that's really how it protects the client. There might be avenues open to the client which the client is not aware unless the client tells the full truth. So its purpose is to protect the client. It's also, and equally importantly there, to ensure the proper administration of justice. Uh, and why that? Well, for instance, there should be equality of arms between the parties. That's a very well-recognized principle uh, in all cases of justice. And clearly, if one side is reading all the messages and knows everything that is going on between the lawyer and client, and the other side doesn't know that, there can be no equality of arms. The other side, the side which is reading all the messages, is able to prepare its case, is able to, if they are uh, doing things illegally, uh, destroy evidence, create evidence, so uh, there's equality of arms and therefore the professional secrecy which exists, exists uh, to ensure that justice runs properly. It must be said it does not exist for any individual. I mean, it might be argued, for instance, that why should Mr. Snowden have the benefit of professional secrecy when he's made it his job to disclose other secrets? He has given away huge caches of secrets, and now we're saying that he himself should be subject to some kind of secrecy. But it doesn't exist for Mr. Snowden. It exists for all of us. It exists for citizens, for the public good, uh, whoever they might happen to be. Um, and uh, it's because of that, no matter how grave the crime, as we know, uh, the usual test measure of a civilization is that the graver the crime, the sounder should be the protection for the administration of justice. And it also exists, uh, professional secrecy, in all fields of law. It obviously exists in criminal law. Um, which we've been speaking about, but it exists in civil law as well, and the Snowden case is a very good example of where spying has impacts on the civil side, because we're not just talking about crimes, we're talking also, for instance, about commercial secrets, of companies' commercial secrets, which are able to be, uh, to, to be, to be spied on. Um, and clearly it's in government's interests in certain circumstances to have access to commercial secrets. For instance, it might be technological secrets in case people are developing technology which might make spying less secure. It might be military secrets or it might be uh, just general commercial secrets which lead to particular foreign companies being, uh, being strong. These secrets pass through lawyers' offices. In fact, one of the concerns uh, is that lawyers' offices might be a weak link uh, in all of this because companies take uh, uh, adequate measures and we need to make sure that lawyers and law firms take adequate measures as well to protect uh, commercial secrets. So that is the basis of professional secrecy. And what is the relationship then between professional secrecy and democracy with which we are all concerned? In essence, democracy, clearly it relies on people being able to vote. But as we know from the invasions of Iraq and elsewhere, democracy is more than the ability to vote. It relies on civil society and certain mechanisms in civil society. And one of the mechanisms in civil society on which uh, democracy relies is the ability to correct its mistakes. So that's something which distinguishes it from dictatorships where there is great difficulty in uh, changing mistakes of a dictator. And there are various mechanisms which are created in democracies to avoid mistakes being made. And the obvious examples are Parliament, where we now are, where, for instance, in the United Kingdom, the opposition is Her Majesty's loyal opposition, loyal to the state, but opposing the government. And it's a mechanism to ensure that everything is discussed properly and mistakes can come to light. There is the press. And there is lawyers and the courts. And particularly if parliament and the press fail, lawyers and the courts become a very important mechanism. And we have here in my own dearly beloved uh, member state from which I come, though I represent in my work all of Europe, a good example recently which is still playing out of the... Um, 
uh, the failures of the certain titles in the Murdoch press uh, where both Parliament and government and the press were uh, intimidated, frightened, uh, uh, seduced, uh, and uh, in fact, although both members of Parliament and members of the press did work to bring out the illegalities, the bad practices which had, had existed, so did lawyers in the courts, and the lawyers in the courts played a very significant role in civil cases which were brought in bringing evidence out. Um, and uh, this is only possible, the, the people, they were celebrities as it happens, were themselves frightened of what might happen to them. Uh, but the only way that the truth can come out and that mistakes can be corrected is if clients have faith in their lawyer, that the lawyer will not disclose their secrets and that these secrets are not available uh, to powerful forces. So we come uh, to the heart of uh, what I want, the message I wanted to pass today, which is, therefore, what is the impact of mass surveillance on the confidentiality of lawyer-client relations? Well, as I've tried to explain, an essential plank of democracy under the rule of law has been removed because, effectively, lawyer-client confidentiality can no longer be guaranteed. I realize it's not all lawyer-client uh, confidentiality, but uh, the state, as we have discovered, has uh, access to everything, including the confidential lawyer-client communications. Um, and once that data is available, uh, it is often available to more than the state. And again, we've seen examples in the United States where agents uh, have misused the data, sold the data, used it for their own purposes. Once the data exists, it can be abused. And so uh, we are very worried that, as I say, an essential plank of democracy has been removed there is no solution in sight. We, as uh, uh, the Council of Bars and Law Societies in Europe, don't know how to advise our member bars and they to advise their member lawyers to make their communications safe. There is no way, there is no technology to our knowledge which exists which will guarantee it. And therefore, until this matter is resolved, uh, we, are, uh, we realize that a part, an essential part, a long-standing part uh, a, a widely recognized part of lawyers' ethics and deontology has just been nullified. And that concerns us uh, seriously because, as I say, of its impact on, uh, on, on citizens. Our recommendations um, are divided really into legal solutions and technical solutions. Um, on the legal front, what we would like to see is at EU level protection for professional secrecy from government surveillance. We think the EU is particularly well situated to do this. We find when we talk to our members that for obvious reasons, uh, at national level, there are, uh, are concerns uh, because they have to react and deal with their government and the whole issue of spying. Spying is both a, it's a good thing, it protects us. Um, and so there's a difficulty in dealing with these issues at national level. But at European level, we've just been hearing where there is either not a spying service or not a developed spying service, the EU is well placed to be able to, uh, to, to, to set standards. I'm perfectly aware that national security is, uh, is not within EU competence, but we would really encourage uh, uh, some kind of EU-level protection for professional secrecy. Uh, we would like to see EU minimum standards for electronic surveillance as well, including on grounds of national security. And regarding technical solutions, we would like there to be guarantees uh, that electronic communications and cloud computing will be secure for professional secrecy. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's, uh, my it is us to thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. Not bad. We've had a, quite a constitutional theory reminder here. Not bad. Coming from you, <coughs> representing the bar and legal associations across Europe. We thank you so much. We've got the feeling we've had uh, something else and more than uh, a simple yellow card regarding the risks that involve the confidentiality between lawyer and client. It's, it's, it's somewhat more than an orange card. It's something really striking, close to a red alert.
So we thank you for the emphasis you put into it. Now, time for discussion. I suggest Rapporteur and Shadows goes to the questions and answers. Um, I think, Chairman, because of time, we're going to take all the questions together. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, conscious yeah. that my colleague, Sophie Interveld, had, had particularly wanted uh, this session because um, she had expressed a lot of concerns about Laura Glidge in relation to this, and I'm grateful that she has done it because I think this has actually been quite a rich contribution now uh, to our inquiry, and I think the way you've expressed it has been so clear, and it has been so clear, so there's no, no real point in asking you about what you've just set out so clearly. So I'm going to just um, extrapolate from that something that we picked up in the inquiry and actually when we were in Washington as well, which is one of the big um, elements of this leakage um, of lawyer-client lawyer privilege, one of the big industrial leakages, which is in the United States, where the allegation has been that one of the reasons, because people are searching for reasons for the allegations of, of data gathering and so on. One of the reasons given, and it's an allegation, is that information goes from, uh, allegedly from NSA to uh, the criminal sphere, uh, law enforcement. Uh, so whether it's you know, drug enforcement and so on. Now that is, if that is happening on a big scale, what are you saying from your, the lawyers that you work with in, in the European Union or in a Europe-wide scale to United States lawyers? This must be, if it's happening, is it happening in your view? If it is happening, how much is it compromising their day-to-day -day activities, those who are working in this field? Is it changing the way that criminal law um, has to operate? Is there any way of uh, dealing with it? Do they have any coping mechanisms for it? Um, how big, and is it in fact happening? Because these are clearly allegations. But that, that is of interest. Um, we also had Jocelyn Raddock and other whistleblowers who talked to us about this, which I go back to my colleague um, Sophie Intervelt, who had raised it initially. So I'll leave that, that to her. But that, that's of interest because I think it is you know, an allegation that we, it would be interesting to know what you think. Shall we measure them together this time? Will you, will you mind? Yes. We'll go together then. we we'll hear from Mr. Sinveld and then from Mr. Albrecht and back to you, Mr. Um Yes, thank you. I have uh, just a few questions. Um, I, I, I think, um, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but I would say uh, targeted surveillance uh, or, or um, eavesdropping on lawyer client uh, conversations, that's only allowed in very, very limited cases with a court order and, and what have you. So I don't think that the Secret Services would uh, engage in um, targeted surveillance on a massive scale. But of course the problem that we're facing now is that your, your communications might, might be part of the bycatch they have. Now, you're a lawyer, would that be legal? in your view, what they're doing, is that legal? And would it actually be possible to just sue the government and sue um, secret services because they are violating your right, even if they're not doing so uh, uh, on purpose? But if, you're, if your communications are in the bycatch, or I don't know the official terms for it, then I would assume that that is illegal. Uh, then you talk... Um, of professional secrecy rather than loyal uh, lawyer client um, uh, uh, confidentiality, I suppose with professional secrecy that would also apply to other um, professions then <coughs> I suppose that would also apply to doctors, for example, because their communications are are implied as well in in the mass surveillance thing journalists. and journalists yes okay, but if you 're talking they don 't have professional well, see, they, they do to, to an extent, but lawyers and doctors, that's a different category. Um, and, and again, I mean, if, if indeed their communications with their patients would be part of the bycatch, in your view, would that be an illegal act by the Secret Services? Yeah, if we could ever prove such a thing. Uh, and then uh, my last question, um, I'm interested in the, the three recommendations that you um, provide. Um, would it be possible to elabor elaborate a little bit on how you would do this constitutionally? Uh, would you, I mean, do you have any ready-made proposals for us to, uh, to submit to, uh, to the European Commission, for example? Uh, Mr. Albrecht. 
<laughs> I, I would just directly follow up on that because uh, uh, your three recommendations, I mean, I, I would also take these three recommendations, but I have to say the first two involve treaty change. Uh, and the third uh, is just uh, was just um, somehow um, declared impossible by Mr. Walter. So um, in the previous panel. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I, I very much uh, like your proposals, but I have to say that uh, also I would see it a bit more um, uh, more problematic uh, than you, Sophie. It's not only bycatch. I mean, these programs like Prism or Tempora, they don't care about who whom they are analyzing. That's not the point. It's not the point anymore about targeting anybody. It's about just collecting patterns of anybody, you know, analyzing. They don't care who it is. Who it is. So at the end, um, uh, we just have to declare with those surveillance measures in place, there's no possibility also in the construction of these programs to decide uh, in favor of uh, confidentiality between uh, specific uh, communication partners because the programs are not written in, in that way. They are automatically analyzing patterns you don't know from whom and in which uh, uh, situation that is uh, directly uh, coming and, and which is the background of that person. Uh, but anyway, that, that leads us to the pessimistic point that I would say it's, it's a clear red card and you have to show a clear red card because uh, with those things in place, there is no confidentiality between lawyer and client anymore. But what I can say is that we have passed just recently a directive on the right to access to lawyer in which, which we said clearly that there is a complete... Uh, confidentiality be between lawyer and client to be respected by member states. But of course, also this di directive has the back door uh, of national security. You know, so uh, it, the dilemma is, whatever we do, we always come back to the point that there is a huge black hole of national security where member states obviously can do everything. But where member states can do everything, perhaps is not that they would be allowed to do everything in their own member state. So the question would go back to your own member state and the question, if, the, if it's compliant with the ECHR when doing national security. And I think that the ECHR rulings and the ECHR itself is applicable also to those cases of national security, that the British Constitution is applicable when it's about national security uh, carried out by the GCHQ, and uh, that, of course, the constitution of, of all um, EU member states is applicable when, uh, for example, cooperating with a third state uh, intelligence service like the NSA. So um, with all these points, we come back to the uh, application of the rules which we already have since I don't know how many years. So uh, that, is, that is, I think, where we need to focus on when it's about this. Uh, and then, of course, the, the question on European level is about the application of European rules. And there uh, it comes back to the outline which I mentioned in the working document before on the question, what is national security? Uh, and how do we interpret the exceptions? For example, in our directive on access to lawyer, to the confidentiality. And I don't think that uh, those surveillance measures which we are talking about are covered by a restrictive interpret uh, interpretation of uh, the national security exemption in the treaties. Okay. Now, oh, back to you, Mr. Goldsmith. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, regarding the first question about leakage of secrets uh, going to the law enforcement agencies, if I understood that correctly, we would not be at all uh, happy with that. Uh, we take a rather absolute view uh, of the lawyer-client confidentiality point. Already now, uh, under the anti-money laundering uh, legislation, which we have opposed heavily in the past, lawyers are supposed to disclose certain uh, 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 suppositions, uh, suspicions uh, to law enforcement agencies. We're not at all happy. We continue to, uh, to try to get that reversed. So I think uh, whichever member state you are, 
there are different rules, and some member states have exceptions that when life uh, is being threatened, you're under a duty to, 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 to break your secret. But essentially, we take a rather absolute view of it, and we would not be happy. Uh, we, we are not happy with leakage uh, and with law enforcement being able to have access uh, to, uh, to the secrets. We, we, we take it as a, uh, on an absolute uh, point of view. Uh, the question uh, from uh, Ms. Interfelt about the, uh, uh, the eavesdropping and, and whether this is illegal or not, I mean, this is going to depend definitely on uh, each member state. Uh, we are at present conducting research into the ability, we have conducted research, it's, it's practically ready, into the ability of um, member states to have access to lawyer-client secrets. As I say, we take an absolute view of it, uh, but there are exceptions. Um, and in fact, each member state has different exceptions and different, uh, different rules, uh, and we are compiling that. So there's no general answer to, you know, is this illegal? Uh, it will depend on the, the, the Constitution. Uh, even the professional secret is differently uh, couched. In some countries, it's actually in the Constitution. In some countries, it's in the Criminal Code. Uh, in in some countries, it's just an evidential rule uh, that can be used in, uh, in litigation. So in each case, you would have to go back. It's not a very satisfactory answer uh, to you, but there are many cases uh, involving lawyer-client confidentiality before the European Court of Human Rights and the breaches of various articles, six, seven, eight, what have you, uh, uh, which, which are used. So certainly, uh, that, that the European Convention uh, is a very helpful uh, overall uh, umbrella protection, uh, but at national level, before going to the European Court of Human Rights, it does depend on, um, uh, on national law. Uh, as to whether professional secrecy applies to others, it does. Quite whether it is the same as lawyers' professional secrecy. Uh, in preparing for this, I came across some statement, which I can't now uh, recall, saying that uh, with, with lawyers were the only ones where professional secrecy was guaranteed by law in every member state. I don't know whether that's true or not. But certainly it would be differently based, I suspect, and I can't really uh, answer for it. But obviously there are other uh, professions which, uh, which have professional secrets and who would be uh, similarly uh, uh, affected. Regarding our three recommendations, which is a, a really a double question, uh, I mean, I think we hadn't thought about it, and you have suggested it. Um, I, I think we might think about whether we could ourselves prepare through our own uh, committee structure, which have uh, legal experts on them, uh, some kind of... Uh, standards or protection. I mean, if that's helpful to you, we could uh, come up with that. I mean, I take the point made, which I think I said myself, that there is no competence at EU level. Is this pointless to do? Personally, my own view is that it is not pointless even if there's no competence. I, I look, we use a lot, the Council of Europe uh, it develops many uh, professional standards, general professional standards, which we use a lot in uh, when we uh, write letters to government saying that they fail to X, Y, and Z, when we're assisting bars in uh, neighboring countries to develop their standards. The development of standards, even with no competence to enforce them, is, it seems to me, a useful thing, and is a useful thing for the future, if ever, competence has changed, I would have thought. So certainly we're happy to try and help to begin to develop uh, some, uh, some kind of standards. Uh, the final point which I have noted uh, was the point from Mr. Elbrecht about uh, a, a lawyer alert. In other words, everything is gathered up and there is no possibility to exempt lawyers from this. On a technical level, and I'm absolutely not a technical, but that cannot be right. Everything is possible technically and it must be possible that if there is, if lawyer-client confidentiality is recognized, uh, and if therefore lawyers enter a certain code, I'm making this up, uh, into their communications, it, it must be possible to exclude them. If there's the will, there's the way, I suspect, but I'm sure there's no will. But, so I think technically it probably could be done, and probably it wouldn't be that difficult to do. I hope I've answered all the questions. Thank you. Any further comments? Sure. Not the case. We really thank you for that, Mr. Uh, By now, we thank you for your cooperation, and I am announcing that we will be resuming our work within the Libya inquiry next week in Strasbourg, 9 December, by 7.30 in Strasbourg. It will be in Strasbourg because it's a plenary. It, eh? 
The room, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. It'll be somewhere in the labyrinth in Strasbourg. It'll be announced in due time. Thank you for that. Bye.